Hi, this is R.J. Shea, and I'm at the St. Louis Artists Guild in Clayton, Missouri. This is our 131st year as an organization, the oldest west of the Mississippi of its kind. And our first guest presenter of this year, 2016, is Panina Achayo, who's a design professor at Washington University. And as you can probably tell, as she's going to tell you, actually, she's not from this area originally, are you? No, I'm not. I'm from Kampala, Uganda. Kampala, Uganda. That's like on the east side somewhere, right? Yes? No? No, that's like 7,000 miles away. <laughs> Panina's presentation tonight was fascinating. I had met her once before and felt compelled to have her come and speak with us if she was kind enough, which she was tonight. And her story is fascinating because here's a woman that was born in Uganda and wound up here at a major university in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, teaching design. But it's more fascinating about the type of design that I think that you're involved in. Why don't you explain to us what you do? So the kind of design work that I strive to do is one that is centered around social issues, um, but most importantly, I'm very interested in navigating um, opportunities for design-based solutions in a developing context. So what is the role that design can play in a developing context? Um, so some, some people might say it's service design or social innovation or socially conscious design or social good, whatever you want to call it. Um, whatever that kind of work is that requires me to, to work with people dealing with complex situations is a kind of work that I strive to do. The one of the things that you showed us tonight was a project in which you went back to uh, Kenya, actually, correct? And you were trying, to, you were working with an organization, trying to come up with uh, icons, iconography, uh, visual communication for people, doctors as well as people living within the country, to understand visualization on how to deal with uh, controlling malaria. Correct. Correct. Correct, yes. So that's a project that um, I collaborated with a couple of colleagues of mine, as well as a design firm in Chicago called Rule 29, who were working in conjunction with an organization called Life in Abundance that is actually doing the bulk of the work in Kibera, Kenya. And so we were tasked with coming up with creative tools that are graphic in nature, more iconographic in nature, that would really help with um, communicating the spread, the symptoms, the cause of malaria to a, a population that you would probably, um, that is very visually literate, but as far as um, uh, written or reading, that is limited. Um, so the, the, the tools that we came up with were meant to sort of serve a visual purpose, that they would communicate in a visual way without us needing text, if possible. One of the problems that you ran into, of course, was that things that we take for granted, icons, various types of visualizations of, of objects or, or activities, which we understand, wasn't easily understood in the, another country. Right, absolutely, especially in this case because we were trying to design for an audience that um, is culturally very different from what you would know here in the West. It was important that as we came up with these icons to represent different signs and symptoms of malaria, for example, that we, um, that we were doing it from their perspective. So for example, if you were trying to illustrate what fever looks like originally from a more Western audience, you know, that might, you know, be something like, you know, I'm hot or, you know, touch my forehead. But, you know, in Kibera, really, you know, if when you think about fever, if someone has a fever, you put a cloth on their head. So, so it was important for us to illustrate that from that point of view without us just sort of assuming that everyone understands fever one way. So by putting those prototypes in the hands of the users, we're able to get valuable information that then helped us design from that perspective. Plus, you have millions of people you're trying to appeal to and communicate with, and at the same time, you have a, a language barrier in many cases, correct? Because the diversification mm -hmm. of peoples and languages is tremendous there. Yes, so it's, it's very important too, especially um, in looking at even just East Africa, whereas that, which is where I do a lot of the work that I do, 
um, you're, you're dealing with a group of people, me inclusive, that, um, that, that speak so many languages. So for example, in Uganda, we have over 50 different tribes who uh, you know, speak different languages. And so despite the fact that yes, on paper, English is the official language, it's important not to take it for granted that everyone speaks English or knows how to read and write in English. Um, so it's important that you, know, you sort of find ways to navigate some of those barriers, which can only be sort of overcome by you being on ground or finding ways to get whatever you're designing into the hands of the users. So you could sort of figure out how to navigate that. So that was really a challenge. But um, again, that is why the icons that we designed hopefully were able to communicate visually without needing text. That was the biggest challenge. And you ran through a number of different variations of this till you got to something that people <laughs> all understood and, and told you that they did so, correct? Absolutely. I th you know, this is a project that took um, probably a span of a year um, and even more um, that just involved us coming up with a bunch of iterations because, again, we were designing back here in the U.S. and anytime we were able to get those prototypes to the hands of the users, then, you know, we get that feedback and then come back and work on them again. And just like any designer or artist works, you know, it's all about iterating and iterating. So you learn, you iterate, you try again, and you keep testing until you come up with a solution that communicates. That's what we do. We try to communicate. So if you can communicate something clearly to your audience, then I feel like you've done your job. And what kind of su success do you have you seen as a result of what you've done in the last couple of years? Or is this going to take much, much longer to, to, uh, to finish out? Yeah, you know, again, you know, <laughs> anytime you define, I think I think the first piece of success we had was coming up with a a, a body of work that uh, was usable in the field. That yes, doctors and uh, clinical workers were like, this is as close as you know we hoped for it to be. So that was one um, sort of phase of success for us. And then I think the next one is one that is ongoing, that is coming with um, this being in the field more, and then starting to understand. Um, sort of if, if the numbers of people, you know, being, you know, infected with malaria or getting treatment, if, there's not, if we see changes in some of those numbers, hopefully based on some of the things well, we came up with, then that will be success. But that's something that is ongoing that is going to take time to collect the data. Is there um, ever, are you going to uh, continue this process with the, the whole malaria uh, icons and, and information graphics or are you going because there's a lot of other diseases that are right. <laughs> that need to be tackled as well correct absolutely i think i think even beyond just malaria even beyond just diseases i think another big sort of um area that i'm very interested in is the area of hygiene and sanitation and i know there's been a lot of groups that have tackled that uh, but i know like for me now in uganda because it's where i, I get to do mo most of my work over the summer um being able to work with teachers and young young students in schools and seeing how they would um communicate some of the issues around hygiene or how do we get like young people to get into a habit of having good practices. So I think for me that's where right now I'm sort of maybe focusing as far as that body of work. But yes, there are many diseases and I would love to, t one of, I actually thought about doing something with Ebola not too long ago. But um, I think if the opportunity arises, I would love to try other diseases. <laughs> That sounds, that sounds compelling. <laughs> that sounds and you go back to Uganda uh, each summer, right, and conduct workshops with who? I, I do go back to Uganda every summer and conduct workshops with young people. And uh, so this is anywhere from secondary level students who are still in secondary school or high school, and also with um, young people who've graduated from high school that are sort of interested in navigating and sort of understanding what, is, what it is that designers do or, or, or what design can do. And so I, I, I run small workshops with them and sort of share some of the practices and the processes that we use as designers in the hope, in the hope of us together sort of forging an identity of, of, of graphic design that is Ugandan, something that we can look at with pride but also sort of share with the rest of the world because we are very rich in terms of cultures and again 50 tribes with you know different sort of practices and symbols and totems. There's so much we can offer so I think um, through these workshops I'm hope, hoping over time that we will come up with a body of work that we can uh, share with the rest of the world and say hey this is something that has come out of Uganda that is Ugandan. And you'd mentioned that there's very, very little that's come out of Africa that's been printed 
And so there's something for you in the future because if anybody can do something like that, it's going to be you. Yes, I hope so. It's actually overwhelming to think, to sit down and think about how there really isn't much from a graphic design sort of history point of view from Africa. It's sort of strange, you know. So I hope I can add to that narrative um, during my time here at WashU. <laughs> and uh, do you feel that WashU is behind you 100% and they're giving you everything that you need in order to uh, prosper and to excel at what you're doing? I do. I wouldn't be here if that was not the case. Um, I, I do believe that I'm surrounded with not only colleagues that are very supportive of the work that I do, but also just being in an institution where you have resources, where I'm able to, you know, travel back home and, you know, do research. That does not, that's not cheap. You know, that's, that's expensive. But um, so uh, allowing me to, to also, like, invest in the kind of research that I'm passionate about because for me, it's important for me to design with conviction, and this is something that I'm very passionate about. So them being able to recognize that and, and still want me for me is something that I, um, I don't take for granted. So, yes. Your passion and vision were evident tonight, and I can't thank you m so much for coming and speaking with us tonight. And I would like to hear you speak more often than just this one time. And uh, we look forward to what you're going to be doing in the future here, okay? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, thanks again for uh, coming tonight, uh, Panina. And uh, we look forward to – and by the way, ladies and gentlemen – and boys and girls and anybody else who's out there, these events are free and open to the public. And if you're not here, too bad, so sad, because these are wonderful events. And we'd like you to come. We're going to have another event in February, second Tuesday of each month. We have a guest presenter, and we look forward to seeing you then. This is RJ and Panina signing out from Clayton, Missouri. Good night.